Zelensky and his uh, fellow leadership um, were driven there under military escort to sign surrender documents akin to the Japanese surrender in the in Tokyo Bay before being arrested and uh, prosecuted as war criminals. Um, I mean, that's literally the only future I believe Zelensky has, that or death or exile. Um, the Ukraine, again, I, I'll make it clear right now, I do not pretend to speak on behalf of the Russian government. Um, I am not here to influence the Russian government. I'm not here to influence anybody. This is my analysis. If I were a, a PhD student tasked with writing a paper on this, uh, this is this is what I would say is uh, Ukraine has forfeited its right as it's currently exists to exist as a nation, as a, as a legitimate sovereign nation state. Um, whatever form Ukraine will take, I believe it will be physically different than the form it uh, enjoyed on February 23rd. Um, and I believe it will be vastly politically different. Um, I, I, I don't think it will be recognizable as Ukraine and it may not exist as Ukraine. I'm very, um, uh, I, was, uh, I was very uh, interested. I, I think my interest was peaked when Russia offered uh, R Russian passports to all Ukrainian citizens. I think that's a portend of the future. Um, I think Ukraine slid its own throat by cutting off um, uh, energy and gas supplies to uh, its its territories. I mean, how can you speak of uh, desiring to reconstitute Ukraine when you turn your back on uh, your own population? Uh, Russia will, of course, um, do what's right, I believe, and uh, and provide for these people. But in doing so, um, I, I, loyalties will shift. I, I believe that uh, what, what eventually is going to happen is that Russia will win over the vast majority of the Ukrainian people to a, a political solution that, um, that is acceptable to all. And, you know, part of the terms of that acceptance will be <laughs> the Ukrainian government as it currently exists is, you know, governments especially when they're in precarious situations. Um, I don't get, mean to be too American here, but it's government of the people, by the people, for the people, meaning that governments really can only exist so long as the people tolerate uh, the government over them. Um, and the Ukrainian population, even those who were inclined to be opposed to the Russian objectives initially. Uh, you know, I am a huge believer in Ukrainian patriotism, legitimate Ukrainian patriotism. I, I think I answered a question somebody asked me earlier if I were, you know, a hypothetical, if I were a Ukrainian in Kharkov and uh, the Russians came across the border, what would I do? And I said, I'd volunteer. Uh, I, I'd, I'd send my wife and children off to the hospital to serve as whatever the equivalent of the Red Cross volunteers are to receive Ukrainian casualties. And I would go to the front lines and do that which my nation required of me in its defense. Um, I respect that. Um, and it, you know, and, and I respect the fact that there are Ukrainians who believe that Ukraine should chart its own future and that um, while they may be vehemently opposed to the right sector, to, to these right wing parties, the solution is a Ukrainian solution, not an imposed Russian solution. I, I, I respect that opinion. Um, unfortunately for them, that's not what happened. Um, the Ukrainian government uh, would not permit this kind of democratic involvement of the Ukrainian people to resolve these problems uh, and instead embarked on um, a policy that invited in uh, foreign interests who were using the Ukraine crisis uh, as a vehicle to undermine Russia. And Russia acted in its legitimate national security interests. I, I think the Russian objectives uh, on February 24, um, although the Russians are consistent in saying we will accomplish all stated objectives, we, we need to be honest. The war today is far different than the war was on February 24th. It's a completely different conflict. Uh, and therefore, the, the Russian objectives have likewise, I believe, changed. Even though Russia still calls it a special military operation, um, Russia's at war with NATO. Russia's at war with the United States. Russia's at war with Ukraine. They still call it a special military operation, but the reality is 
This is a war. The fact that Russia chooses to prosecute this war with limited military resources um, is a compliment to the professionalism and the political patience of Russia. Um, I, I, I will tell you right now, if you had asked me in uh, March if I thought that this war could extend into the summer months um, with this kind of sustained, intense combat, uh, without Russia mobilizing, I would have said you're high because basic military math. I mean, let's just go with offensive military operations. You want a three to one advantage. That's just classic military math. If I'm attacking you, I need three of me for every one of you. Um, Russia flipped that on its head and they're attacking with one of them and three of the Ukrainians. Um, so that right there is a problem. The other thing is intensive large-scale ground combat in a European environment of the sort that we're witnessing in Ukraine today, um, you don't get casualty ratios that deviate far from one-to-one. -one. I mean, you might see in a situation, for instance, uh, if you take the, Ru the Great Russian Victories, destruction of Army Group Center um, and the Great Envelopment Victories uh, after Stalingrad, um, the casualty ratios were like 1.2 uh, dead Germans for every one Russian. Even though there were great Russia Soviet victories, the Germans killed a lot of Soviets in the process. I mean, it was it was grotesquely uh, dangerous. Um, and here we're looking at you know uh, levels of lethality that have gone up by orders of magnitude in terms of the weapon systems involved. We're dealing with highly trained military on the part of the Ukrainians, competent leadership. Um, and I, I would have been shocked to see, you know, Russian Ukrainian casualty ratios, especially with a one to three disadvantage that, um, that veered too far away from one to one. So if we're looking at a Russian victory requiring the inflicting of 75,000 dead Ukrainians, I would have said, man, that's going to be a lot of dead Russians too. That's not happening. I mean, there's a lot of dead Russians, so I'm not minimizing the cost. So a lot of dead Russians, a lot of de dead Lugansk and Donetsk militia members. Let's not pretend that, no, that this is a bloodless victory. It is not. But the casualty ratios are in the order of one to five, one to six, one to seven. For every Russian or Donetsk militiaman that goes down, Lugansk militiaman goes down, you know, six or seven Ukrainians are going down. This is insane. So you how do you square, because it sounds like there's, there's a contradiction going on here. You said that the, the military is, um, um, the Ukrainian military is professional and well-trained and all that. Then why is the ratios like this? Well, the, the and okay, now we come to, to, to the answer. The, the answer is the professionalism of the Russian military. Okay, uh, you know, and I'm not here to blow smoke up anybody's, you know what, um, you know, the Russians are human. They prove that every day because they die. They make mistakes. Uh, you, and, and when new weapon systems are introduced, uh, it takes Russia a moment to, uh, to adapt. The HIMARS, the, you know, we can talk about that later. The, 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 the appearance of HIMARS on the battlefield, you know, is, is, is thrown a curveball. Um, but if you know anything about baseball, um, one pitch does not a game make. Uh, so, you know, yeah, hey, nice curveball. Strike one on the Russians. Um, try it again. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. Um, you know, the, the Russians are adapting. And here's the deal. Russia started this conflict. And we need to be honest. Um, the Russian military, as professional as they were, were untested. Largely untested going into this conflict. Oh, yes, Syria. Syria is a small scale conflict. Uh, you weren't operating at the uh, combined arms army level. In Syria, we're not talking about joint operations on the scale that's being seen in Ukraine. It was an untested, modern, professional military that had an untested doc and, 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 and they had an untested organization. And they applied that in the initial phases. Uh, we've had this conversation before where they, they deviated from doctrine. They sought uh, a, a, take a softer approach. Um, it wasn't war. It was a special military operation, et cetera, et cetera. And they did okay, but not great. Not great. They suffered some setbacks. But the beauty of professionals is you only have to hit them in the face once. 
before they say, I don't want that to happen again. And the Russians have adapted their doctrine, adapted their organizational structure, adapted the way they fight um, dramatically. I will tell you right now that the battalion tactical group that you saw on February 24th does not exist today. It's been transformed into something different, something that has additional attachments. They've taken away uh, superfluous uh, units. They've, they've created the perfect military unit for the operation they are being called upon to fight. And they have, the, they have perfected a system of support where it is sustainable, meaning that you're not burning your troops out on the front. You're fighting, you're accomplishing the mission, you're re regrouping, resting, re-equipping, going back into the fight. And they have this cycle in play that is just a machine that is going in and doing the job. And they are so effective at this that um, you know, they are able to achieve these kill ratios. Now you say, well, wait a minute, why aren't Ukrainians are professional? Why aren't they doing the same? I'll introduce, uh, and I'm sure many people know the name, John Boyd, U.S. Air Force Colonel, fighter pilot. And old, old Boyd, you know, I forget, it was 13-second Boyd or 20-second Boyd, whatever. But his thing was, you get in a jet fighter, I get in a jet fighter, we go head-to-head -head in 13 seconds, I'm going to shoot you down every single time. Because I will initiate certain maneuvers that cause you to react to me, and I will get inside your OODA loop. The observe, orient, decide, act loop, decision-making cycle. Once I get inside that loop, they're dead every single time. Well, Russia is so deep inside the Ukrainian OODA loop that the Ukrainians don't stand a chance. The Ukrainians are reacting to the Russians. React. There is no let-up. The Russians continue to push and push. There's no pause. The Ukrainians don't get a chance to go back and go, whoa, let's take a look at what we're learning. Because every time they step back, the Russians hit them in the face again. They're now up, hands up, defending. They don't have a chance to do anything other than rope a dope, and it ain't working. So that's why the Ukrainians are dead. Now the West is trying. The West is trying to infuse new, uh, new, new equipment. Uh, but how do you insert equipment into a military that's not organized, trained, or prepared to accept this equipment to maximum value? You can't. The U.S. is providing. Outstanding intelligence support. I'm an, I'm an intelligence officer. I like good intelligence, but I can give good intelligence to bad people and it's useless. And I don't mean the Ukrainians are bad. I mean, the Ukrainians right now are on their back foot. I'm giving them the intelligence that says, we need to maneuver up forward, jab, jab, pump, pump. And they're going, hell no, I'm getting hit in the face. I'm going back. I don't have time to use this intelligence properly. The, the, the Russians are in the OODA loop on uh, tactical operational, strategic level, militarily. The Russians are in the OODA loop, and this is as important politically and economically. The Russians right now are controlling Europe's economic future. Europe is not in control. Russia is. Russia can hit switches anytime they want and get things to happen. And Russia, I think, is being very mature about this, meaning that rather than, because another thing is when you throw your best punch, and you don't knock the other guy out, you got problems. So maybe the best thing to do is just jab, 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 and make him think you got the knockout punch. I'm not saying Russia doesn't have the knockout punch, but if Russia does what we did, because we came in with the Sunday haymaker, hey, Russia, sink it, boom. And Russia went, thank you. We got it. And now we're adapting. It's interesting. Putin kind of actually said something last week to that effect. I'm paraphrasing here. You haven't seen anything yet. OK. And it was interesting, George Piskov, kind of, one of those rare times he kind of came in and kind of massaged what Putin had to say. It's very rare that that ever happens. OK. Um, uh, I still don't know really what to think of it. But then again, as George I, and I have agreed long ago, is that Russians, they don't bluff. They act, just as you said, Scott. Go ahead, George. Sure. Well, I, I, look, the bottom line is, you're right. It, 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 the person that says that they can um, read Vladimir Putin um, is probably the person that you don't want to have part of your conversation. Uh, the person that says, I listen to Vladimir Putin is the person you want to have. In. And that doesn't mean Putin's God. He's not. He's human. He's the, he's the executive of an of a imperfect nation, Russia. Every nation's imperfect. Um, you know, it, 
you know, there's a tendency right now because everything's going Russia's way for people to, you know, put Russia up on the 10 foot, you know, pedestal and, and, and pray to the, to the, to the Russian God. No, Russia is Russia, nothing more, nothing less. Um, that's good, bad. That's ugly. It's everything. Uh, you know, Putin is the leader of Russia. He's been in a long time. So he's, He's knowledgeable. <laughs> there, there isn't much that's going to take Putin by surprise. That's one of the reasons why he's so calm in this extraordinarily difficult situation. Um, but he's also a man who's confident, not only in his own abilities, but the abilities of his subordinates, and the abilities of his, of his country. So when he says, we well, ain't even got started, there go. that's there coming go. from a position of knowledge. That's not speculation. That's not Zelensky ordering a million men to be mobilized to take over the South. Okay? It's not fantasy. It's not fiction. It's reality based. And it shows a level of maturity and a level of preparation that the West needs to respect. Because I'm not saying that it's the West's job to roll over and play dead because Vladimir Putin has spoken. No, if the West wants to be anti-Russia, that's their choice. They get to make that choice. But they need to understand, if you're going to be a responsible policymaker, that there are consequences for your act, and that these consequences are reality-based, and Putin is the mouthpiece of reality at this point in time. So when he says this, I would say that the best advice I could give people is to stand up and listen and try and understand what that means. Because at the end of the day, even if you're anti-Russia, you're supposed to be pro-America first. And sometimes being anti-Russia to the expense of your own nation is pretty stupid policy. It doesn't mean you have to be pro-Russia, but it might mean we might want to find a way to live with these guys in peace and harmony. Um, yeah. Scott, well, what, what do you think then is going on? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've talked about what's going on in the minds of uh, Putin. What do you think is going on in the minds of, let's say, um, uh, Lloyd Austin? I mean, they say, okay, we, you know, we mustn't let Putin win. Okay, what, what's, what do they mean by that? What, 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 what are they thinking? What's the next step? I mean, that, you, know, that, you know, that's just a slogan. We mustn't let Putin win. What, what, what do they think is going to be the, the next thing that's going to happen? Well, I'm going to parse that uh, that that statement first, uh, not because you said it, because Lloyd Austin said it. We mustn't let Putin win. The hubris that's contained in that is unreal, unimaginable, unfathomable. We mustn't let, as if you're in control. You're not. Uh, you've jumped off the cliff. You don't have a parachute, and the wind is blowing you in whatever direction it wants, Lloyd Austin. Uh, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, that whole crew, uh, and the president, Biden, they, they believe, and this, this comes down, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but I mean, you know, the thing about the United States is, is in taking these extreme policies, they bring everything to, the, to a head. And so you have to look at, you know, everything's come together, this giant boil that needs to be lanced. Um, Rules-based international order that which defines American foreign and national security policy today. Not me saying it, it's right there in the interim national security strategy guidance. Blinken mentions it every other phrase. Biden prays to it. Jake Sullivan does whatever he does to it. Um, and, and, and Lloyd Austin um, is, is, you know, he's, he's, he's a prisoner of a policy he didn't write. I'll just say that. Lloyd Austin is, unlike Blinken, unlike Sullivan, unlike the others that are in the Biden orbit, Austin is an add-on. He's not part of the original process. Um, he is also somebody whose roots are in a military system that's supposed to be apolitical. It's supposed to serve the gr greater good of the United States, not necessarily the political ambitions of uh, any given administration. But the way the United States has devolved recently, um, we see the military over and over again. And, and, you know, civilian leadership of the military is an absolute in the United States. It's a constitutional prerequisite. But it doesn't mean that the military simply salutes and obeys. The military is there to advise. 
the military is there to be a neutral constant that serves any president, Democrat, Republican, we ever elected independent, they get served by the military equally, which means the military can't be seen as a partisan cheerleader. The military's job is to say, these are the facts. This is reality. Uh, what's your policy? If you want me to accomplish that policy, then I have to do the following. Austin's got ahead of that. Austin stepped into the, the policy game. Uh, and and it's, it, it's, it's reflective in that statement. Um, you know, we cannot let Russia win. Russia is going to do whatever Russia wants to do unless you beat Russia. It's not about allowing Russia. It's not about being the person that says, hey, Russia, two steps forward, not a little bit more to the left. Uh, you're not in control of Russia. Russia's not doing what you want. Russia's not marching to the beat of your drummer. If you want to change Russia, you have to beat Russia, meaning it's not about letting Russia do something. It's about making Russia do something. And the fact is we don't have the resources uh, capable of achieving that outcome which is what an honest military assessment would be. Mr. President, you know, to quote a line from my favorite movie, <laughs> your ego is writing checks your body can't cash. You know, the president's out there saying things, uh, implementing policies, and he, he's getting ahead of the game. That doesn't mean that America surrenders, but America needs to learn to operate within the realm of reality, and it's not but Scott, if, I mean, going back to um, Putin cannot be allowed to win. I mean, that has <laughs> horrific implications. Um, I mean, because I mean, it's you said it, George, and I have said it. But it, it's not in common parlance that this is Russia and NATO are at war, and there's only one thing: if Russia is not allowed to win, Putin is not allowed to win. That means escalation. Well, it, it you know, in the old school, you're right. But we're dealing with a new world. And what I mean by that is we're dealing in a world where America isn't what it used to be. And I'll give you an example. You know, we stayed in uh, Afghanistan for so long because the Taliban could not be allowed to win. We can't let the Taliban win. We can't let the, they won. They won. And eventually we went, I guess, Taliban won. And we left. Now, the way we left, though, wasn't to do it honorably. The way we left was through deception, denial, deceit, lies. And the, the liar in chief was the president himself. Proof positive, telephone conversation, July 23rd, 2021, between Joe Biden and Ashraf Ghani, the president, then president of Afghanistan, where Ghani was crying about 20 to 30,000 screaming meanies coming over the border. Um, his military was in, in full retreat. And the Americans were withdrawing the air support he needed to survive. He said, if we don't get the air support back, this is all done. It's collapsed. We're gone. It's, it's immediate. And Biden said, whoa, stop. I need, to get on, I need you to get on TV and say the exact opposite, that everything's okay. It's all going to be okay. Even, and this is the direct quote, even if it's not true. So the President of the United States instructed a leader of a sovereign nation to lie to create a perception. And then, and, and the purpose of that perception wasn't to position the United States to impose its will, it so the United States could cut tail and run. I'm here to say, with as much confidence as I can bring to bear after watching the NATO summit, that this will not escalate because it can't escalate. There's that NATO literally has nothing. So how do they, how do they, how will they explain their failure then? I mean, oh, they just won't call it a failure. Oh, no. The, first of all, I, I think the, uh, the conversation is going to be changing dramatically. Right now, we have Jan Stoltenberg seeking to transform a non-existent 40,000 man rapid response force. It's non-existent. Yep. I mean, they're on paper somewhere. Some NATO people might say we got 40,000 people. I dare you to mobilize them, Jan. Do it's it. a PowerPoint. It's, right it's, it's a nothing. PowerPoint presentation. Well, yes, but now he's taken Jack's magic bean and he's put it in the ground and he said, turn it into 300,000 non-existent people. Um, <laughs> NATO doesn't have a military capable. Uh, let me put it this way. The Ukrainian military 
if it had turned west and marched on Poland, would have wiped the Polish military off the face of the earth. The Ukrainian military would have destroyed Romania, would have taken the Baltics in, in six days. That's how bad NATO is. Germany could not have mobilized because they can't. They, they, they cannibalized their pitiful armored brigades to get one battalion, reinforced battalion group in Lithuania. The British <laughs> are scraping the bottom of the barrel to get one battalion in Estonia. And Stoltenberg saying, I want to transform them into brigades. And the British <laughs> are going, we don't have it. And the Germans are like, huh? Um, so no, NATO, it does, and, and that's the thing about escalation. Because to escalate, you, you got to have something. The only country that has anything is the United States, and we don't have enough. We yeah, don't have enough. Scott, this, <laughs> the same question. How do they walk this back? I mean, is he, I mean I'm mean, i glad oh. you brought up the issue of, of Afghanistan, but, you know, that is just a blip on TV for most people. 20, you know, we're still in Afghanistan. 20 years, well, that's a long time. We're still there? I mean, but this is not, Afghanistan is not Russia. No, I agree, but let me let me ask you this question. You're, let's say you're a politically engaged German citizen, all right? And, and you're sitting in, I was going to say a Munich beer hall, but that's probably not a good sit play. We'll, we'll call it a Frankfurt beer hall or Berlin <laughs> beer hall, okay? And you're, and, you're, and you're chatting with your other politically inclined German friends. You might be talking about NATO and Russia right now. Yeah. In November, you ain't going to be talking about NATO and Russia. You're going to be talking about how damn cold you are. Yep. Why industries? The, 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 the entire conversation is about to change, which is why there won't be any escalation, because NATO will cease to matter, and that's the reality. When you have a military alliance that exists for no other purpose than to perform the, the, the motions of a self-licking ice cream cone, it's here to please itself. It doesn't defend anything from anybody. It's just here to create the illusion of power. Um, it, it means it's irrelevant. It literally is an irrelevant organization. It has no relevance on the world states. You think the Chinese are actually urinating their pants right now because NATO's threatening to move into the Pacific? No. You think the Russians are fearful of NATO? No. No one is. Turkey thinks it's a joke. Most NATO members think they're a joke. It is a joke. 